Greetings. I'm Dr. Deborah Fennell. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the International Nurses Society on Addictions webinar series that focuses on the use of opioid therapies for treatment of opioid dependence and on the safe use of opioids in treatment of chronic pain. This series is one of many resources made available by the Prescribers Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies, a program that is funded by the Federal Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and operated collaboratively by six other partner organizations. The American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Medical Association, American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, American Dental Association, and the American Society for Pain Management Nursing. Just a few quick um, housekeeping notes before we get to today's presentation. In the upper right of your computer screen, you will see a control panel. In the lower portion of that panel, participants can type in a question or comment and submit it to the webinar organizers. You can do this at any time during the presentation. We will reserve time at the end for questions and answers. If we're unable to get to all of your questions in the allotted time, Dr. Strobe has agreed to respond to them in writing. The webinar presentation slides and the questions and answers will be posted on our website in the near future. Today, Dr. Strobe will describe one approach to the design, implementation, and evaluation of a buprenorphine clinic, a multidisciplinary model for opioid maintenance therapy. During his presentation, he will address the following. One, review introductory and background information regarding the design, implementation, and evaluation of an outpatient buprenorphine clinic for the treatment of opioid dependence. Two, list and describe the essential features of the buprenorphine clinic. Three, provide demographics and clinical characteristics for the initial patient population. Four, describe process measures, outcomes, and patient satisfaction survey results. And lastly, discuss treatment implications and potential acceptance and adaptability to other settings. Dr. Strobe is an addictions nursing specialist at the University of Michigan Addiction Treatment Services, or UMATS, and he and is an adjunct clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from Eastern Michigan University, a Master of Science degree in adult psychiatric mental health nursing from the University of Michigan, and a PhD in nursing with a concentration in biobehavioral health, also from the University of Michigan. His dissertation was titled Alcoholics Anonymous, Personal Stories, Relatedness, Attendance, and Affiliation. He maintains specialty certification both in psychiatric and addictions nursing, including as a certified addictions registered nurse advanced practice or a CARN AP. In his current position, he provides psychiatric evaluations, medical management for patients in addictions treatment. Stephen is an active member of the International Nurses Society on Addictions and currently serves on the board of directors. Please. Uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Strobe. Stephen? Thank you, Dr. Fennell, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I suspect that uh, this hour will pass rather quickly, and I hope profitably, um, so let's go ahead and get started. For those, uh, uh, much of the talk today is derived from a publication that was published just last year in the Journal of Addictions Nursing, which is the professional journal for the International Nur Nurses Society on Addictions, or INSA. And the citation is available um, there for anyone who afterward would like to access that and uh, study this further. First, to provide a context and a framework for the problem and the challenges of addressing opioid uh, dependency, a few comments, recent uh, data regarding the extent of the problem. In a recent report by the Executive Office of the President of the United States dated in 2011, prescription drug abuse was named as our nation's fastest growing drug problem. It was determined by a SAMHSA study in 2010 that of those age 12 and over who had first-time drug exposure, um, that nearly a third of those began by using a prescription medication non-medically. 
among young people, uh, and these are eight, um, grades 7 through 12, this is derived from the Monitoring the Future study, which comes from the University of Michigan. Um, prescription drugs are now the second most abused category of substances after cannabis. It's also been noted that the prevalence of prescription opioid abuse now greatly exceeds that of illicit opioids, such as heroin, and prescription opioid dependence has now come to become the profile of opioid dependence in the United States. So it's um, now becoming the rule rather than the exception. This brings us to the use of buprenorphine, which was authorized through Data 2000, or the Drug Administration uh, Treatment Act, in order to be able to provide office-based treatment of opioid dependence rather than the previous reliance almost exclusively on methadone uh, clinics. Certainly the drug had been around um, previous to that in other formulations, including both um, an injectable form as well as transdermal patches, uh, primarily for pain management. But um, since then, the use of buprenorphine has shifted pronouncedly um, and primarily, if not exclusively, to the treatment of opioid dependence. The medication can be used for short-term treatment, such as detoxification, or, as is the focus of our talk today, on opioid maintenance therapy or replacement therapy. Um, as with other medications for addictions, uh, buprenorphine is meant to be administered in conjunction with psychosocial treatment, not medication alone. It requires some special education and training, and it uh, provides a modified DEA number for prescribing. Uh, but these are currently limited only to physicians as part of the original legislature. There's now a progressive movement afoot, uh, um, which includes legislative efforts to include qualified advanced practice nurses as prescribers. And the need for that really is quite pronounced, um, as the number of physicians who originally enrolled to be available to prescribe buprenorphine has actually decreased rather than increased over time. Specifically, there's a bill, H.R. 1727, titled the Opioid, Opiate Addiction Treatment Act, which has been introduced by Congressman uh, Dutch Ruppersberger, um, which would allow for such prescribing privileges. There are a pair of papers to which I would refer you. Um, these were both published uh, in the Journal of Addictions Nursing, the first by Dr. Al Rundio, um, who provides a policy perspective regarding uh, buprenorphine prescribing by APRNs, or Advanced Practice Registered Nurses. And it, in addition to that, we published a position paper um, for the prescribing of buprenorphine by Advanced Practice Addictions Nurses. Um, there's also a fact sheet available uh, for Advanced Practice Nurses having the ability to prescribe. And the latter two of these, the position paper as well as the fact sheet, are available by visiting the INSA website, www.insa.org, and using the links first for publications and then for position papers. A brief review of the medication buprenorphine itself. Buprenorphine is classified as a partial um, mu opioid agonist. Um, it has properties both as an agonist um, opioid agent, which is primarily of the uh, mu receptors, and it also has antagonist uh, properties, which are primarily of the kappa subcategory. Buprenorphine has a very high binding capacity, high protein binding capacity, which has clinical implications. Um, for example, um, it's important that patients are for induction, that patients are actually experiencing opioid withdrawal before the medication is administered. Otherwise, what happens is with the administration of buprenorphine, um, it will actually um, displace other opioids and can induce an opioid withdrawal, a classic opioid withdrawal syndrome. Some of the perceived benefits of buprenorphine are that it may have a decreased subjective euphoric 
um, effect on people who use this medication and appears to have uh, limited increased tolerance, which is classic of opioids in general, that as people uh, take these medications over time, they require higher and higher doses with all the complications that are associated with that. That seems not to be the case uh, with, uh, with buprenorphine. In fact, there have been suggested that there actually is a dosing ceiling that uh, occurs because of neuroreceptor saturation, and that somewhere in the range between 24 and 32 milligrams per day, um, that as many as 95% of the neuroreceptors are saturated or occupied by the medication, and so exceeding that dose has no practicable effect. As mentioned, the two primary formulations um, now for buprenorphine uh, are used as either sublingual tablets, which were the first to be issued, and then more recently um, a sublingual um, film. But as mentioned earlier, there are other formulations as well, including both the injectable and the transdermal patches. The primary distinction with uh, the sublingual administrations are whether or not these are paired with naloxone. With naloxone, um, the medication uh, trade name is suboxone, and without the naloxone, it is subutex. This was part of the Data 2000, the requirements for the medication, um, in order to decrease the likelihood of illicit use, particularly um, uh, intravenous administration. I think it's important and helpful to acknowledge sooner rather than later that uh, the use of buprenorphine or opioid maintenance therapies in general is not without controversy. This has been true since the dawn of uh, the use of methadone to treat opioid dependence, and it certainly has carried through um, with the use of buprenorphine as well. Um, for understandable reasons, buprenorphine has been credited with having the capacity to, to actually revolutionize the treatment of opioid dependence, and some of the advantages that are, were associated with this uh, could, could were to have been increased access uh, through office-based um, therapies and decreased stigma, moving away from the need for daily or near daily visits to a methadone clinic to allow people to pursue their personal and professional responsibilities without the same burden um, in addressing their opioid dependence. Um, another aspect of the controversy relates to abstinence versus harm reduction philosophies. And this is a, a point that treatment facilities, our own included, across the country needed to wrestle with, that for a number of decades, most, if not all, treatment uh, for addictions was focused on an abstinence-based recovery model, usually employing the Minnesota model um, with mutual help group participation, such as Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. Suddenly, with the advent of buprenorphine, we were shifted to uh, confront the idea of a harm reduction model, raising questions not only among patients but staff about what constituted real recovery. Is it possible for an individual to truly be in recovery if, in fact, they're taking a replacement medication? Some of the other controversies are um, focused on still the higher expense generally um, between buprenorphine and the more traditional methadone approaches and limitations for some patients in terms of availability. At least in our own home state of Michigan, for example, when we've treated patients who are receiving buprenorphine um, in conjunction with uh, Medicaid coverage, the state will not uh, approve the use of buprenorphine beyond an initial one-year period. And so the expectation is not that the patient be maintained on maintenance therapy at all, but uh, be tapered off the medication with um, the potential for serious clinical consequences associated with that. 
at the time that buprenorphine uh, hit the market, there really was a decided lack of long-term experience in terms of how it is that we might best be able to treat patients over beyond that initial induction um, period. Buprenorphine is not without various forms of misuse, and many of these are becoming identified um, more recently. Um, these include the use of buprenorphine um, among um, opioid-dependent individuals in order to either um, withdraw themselves, um, sometimes they actually take a break away from their primary drug of choice. Um, naive individuals who may not be opioid dependent at all um, may be introduced to opioids um, by using someone else's buprenorphine. And then controversy exists regarding the prescribing of buprenorphine to younger patients. Um, what type of pattern does an individual need to uh, uh, demonstrate in order to be considered uh, a viable and perhaps appropriate candidate for opioid replacement therapy? Uh, the younger brain, of course, is still highly impressionable with neuroplasticity, and with uh, brain development now being considered not to have been complete until age 25 or so, are we actually priming younger patients for higher incidence of opioid dependence over time by exposing them to the medication at such a young age. Buprenorphine has been shown to be a relatively safe and effective form of pharmacotherapy for the treatment of opioid dependence. And what we faced was that uh, while protocols and algorithms had been developed for the earlier portions of treatment, including induction during with, um, withdrawal or reduction and stabilization, very few publications, if any, actually describe any specific programs or approaches in order to try to address the longer term maintenance therapy of this medication. And uh, fewer still had examined the phenomenon from the perspective of patient satisfaction. So here we describe um, the initial design, um, implementation, and evaluation of a small pilot project. It was initiated in 2007 here at the University of Michigan Addiction Treatment Services for a monthly buprenorphine clinic um, for maintenance therapy in an outpatient program. We'll include demographic and clinical characteristics of the initial participants, process measures, and patient satisfaction survey results. So um, the caveat that I'd like to offer in this is that we're, we're not proposing that this is the, the uh, sole way to administer this kind of care. In fact, we're describing a model um, for a buprenorphine clinic um, distinct from the model. And there's a great deal that needs to be considered when any particular treatment program decides, uh, first of all, if, and then secondly, how they may choose to design and administer such a program. And so I'm hoping that part of our time together today can be spent calling some information, suggestions, recommendations, uh, clinical experiences from, um, from you um, in the listening uh, audience. So ways that you can do that is um, enter these as uh, the same as you would questions um, during the course of the webinar. But if things occur to you later, please feel free to send your thoughts or observations um, to me directly um, at my email address, stroby at med.umich.edu. For any questions that we don't have time to answer, as Dr. Fennell mentioned, during the live portion of the seminar today, I will be responding to those in writing. And I will also include any of the uh, comments suggestions, recommendations, and experiences that you offer as well. I hope that this can become uh, a sharing house of, of ideas for how best to treat this growing and potentially challenging population. As part of our own experience, we fell into the need to address this challenge differently um, when we came to the conclusion that we were treating this phenomenon more by default rather than design. Um, and many individuals had, or many clinics had found themselves um, needing to accommodate the, uh, a 
a new population with a new philosophy and new clinical needs um, without the advantage of algorithms to be able to um, help direct how that care was going to be administered. So what we found when after we'd been uh, providing buprenorphine to our own patient population for some time was that we certainly had opportunities to improve our own services. In part, patients were seen uh, being seen by uh, prescribing psychiatrists in our own clinic. Uh, we practice predominantly um, addictions psychiatry. All of our physicians are psychiatrists and uh, board certified um, addictions specialists as well. They were the prescribers, um, but the principles, both generally and within our own clinic, were that medications also be prescribed in conjunction with psychotherapy. Well, for those patients who had already passed through the more acute phases of treatment, including, um, for example, our, any of our intensive outpatient treatments or even some of the early recovery groups, then in order for them to be able to continue receiving the medication, they needed some form of psychosocial care as well. Oft times this was being provided then by the, the psychiatrist in conjunction with the medication visits. As a result of that, we had some significant variance then just in the ways that each of the patients were being handled by the respective physicians, just in um, expected differences in um, practice patterns. And so frequency of visits by the patients, the ways in which the physicians were monitoring the patient's progress, including the use of urine drug screens and the means of addressing issues, um, including missed appointments, differed. Um, in addition, this we, we identified that this was a group of patients that didn't have their own dedicated group. Um, and this created some tension, both in the uh, more intensive programming as well as some of the ongoing therapy groups. The fact that um, historically treatment has been abstinence-based certainly wasn't lost on the patients who were participating in treatment here within our own clinic. And so there was actually some, uh, some stigma, some tension between the respective treatment groups and patient populations. Why is it that uh, that individual gets to have medication and, and I don't? And as a result of that, they sometimes felt um, uh, stigmatized by their own treatment mod modality. Finally, we lacked a clear and consistent mechanism to allow us to transfer patients from some of the more acute levels of care, such as intensive outpatient programming, to an ongoing opioid maintenance therapy. This prompted us then to create a specialized clinic which we hoped might better meet the needs of this important and emerging population. We base this program on principles of continuous quality improvement. Drug addiction treatment as set forth by NIDA or the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, principles of group psychotherapy as described by Yalom and contingency management, which had a long and well-established history in opioid treatment, including methadone maintenance programs. Because this was a quality improvement um, activity, um, when we contacted our own um, Institutional Review Board, or IRB, they were kind enough to issue us a waiver, which allowed us then, as long as we de-identified the um, data, to um, collect um, present um, and publish our findings and participate in, in dissemination such as this in, in an effort to improve and set high standards for this form of treatment. A multidisciplinary work group convened and uh, defined the problem in an effort to define the problem and to offer potential solutions. And from this collaboration, this work together, the concept of creating a buprenorphine clinic, a dedicated clinic, emerged. And some of the essential features that were associated with that included patient participation, uh, the provision of psychosocial treatment along with pharmacotherapy, 
um, the creation of a multidisciplinary team, the ability to be able to allow for medication visits um, in order to continue pharmacotherapy without interruption, and the use of urine drug screens for continued monitoring. It was decided that patients who would be receiving ongoing buprenorphine therapy would be required at a minimum to participate in a monthly buprenorphine clinic um, with the belief that this would help to provide increased structure, support, and accountability to patients. And that as a result of that, there would be increased patient satisfaction and improved outcomes. And that ultimately, this would also lead to more efficient use of resources, not only staff and patient time, but also the use of patient benefits. Up until that time, most patients were seen if, if treatment were continuing uh, in a um, weekly ongoing um, outpatient group. But it was thought that once individuals had reached a certain level of stability in terms of their buprenorphine maintenance therapy, did it really make sense for them to have to come um, each week? It was hoped that certainly by then they would have established and maintained stronger and broader supports within the um, community recovery program. And that was also taxing their benefits at an accelerated rate, um, as well as imposing a burden of attendance and participation on them. The buprenorphine clinic was intended from the outset to expand and complement an array of treatment options, uh, not to replace all of those. So we certainly were still looking for people to always receive whatever was the best individualized indicated level of care, which in some instances may, have may still have included an ongoing weekly therapy group, or individual psychiatric visits and medication management. Patients were to be referred to the buprenorphine clinic only after having achieved a certain level of clinical stability. So we weren't sending, we weren't, certainly weren't looking to send patients to buprenorphine clinic right out of the chute after detoxification and um, a relatively brief intensive outpatient program. We wanted to emphasize the importance of psychosocial treatment which is generally considered a standard of care in addictions treatment for virtually any medication related to addictions treatment, whether it's um, uh, disulfiram or anabuse, naltrexone, injectable or oral, or in this case, buprenorphine. And in fact, the provisions were clearly stated in data 2000 that physicians who were administering, who were prescribing buprenorphine had a responsibility to either provide or refer their pa patients um, for appropriate counseling and other non-pharmacologic therapies. That principle of psychosocial treatment was further reinforced by the manufacturers of the um, brands Suboxone or Subutex, that is Reckitt Van Kaiser, in their patient and clinician pamphlets. In a technical assistant publication or TAF that was um, designed for nurses working in clinics in which buprenorphine was administered. They emphasized the importance of ensuring psych that psychosocial counseling is delivered concurrently with pharmacologic interventions. So it was decided then that each session of the buprenorphine clinic would include a dedicated psychosocial group for patient education and support, and that this was to be exclusive for those uh, who were receiving buprenorphine therapy. A multidisciplinary team was formed with representation from medicine, which included, in our case, an addiction psychiatrist, nursing, um, a, specifically a certified addictions registered nurse. This is a level of uh, board certification that's available for nurses with uh, special training and experience in, in addressing addictions. The CARN is obtained through um, INSUM. We also had a social work therapist, masters prepared, who specialized in addictions treatment and had previous experience working in methadone clinics in the past. For patient convenience, this group was scheduled um, for evening hours because in part um, the patient profile was one of 
um, relatively higher functioning individuals, the, uh, the majority of whom were employed. The idea was that with a single monthly visit, patients would be able to come have an individualized appointment with a physician for their prescription review and renewal if indicated. Um, would be able to provide a urine drug screen and participate in their own dedicated group therapy session all with a single visit once a month. In terms of the medication visits, um, these were brief individual appointments that could be available either um, immediately before or after the monthly clinics. These were purposefully kept short, um, in part by being limited to concerns related um, directly to the buprenorphine uh, only. So for example, for patients who were looking for other medication management, including psychiatric evaluations or pharmacotherapy, those appointments and issues were scheduled to be addressed at other times to try to keep the buprenorphine um, um, clinic times related um, directly to that level of care. Consistent with the principles of contingency management, we wanted to recognize and reward patients who had been showing high levels of attendance and adherence, and so there was there's some flexibility then available to the prescriber in terms of um, just how long that prescribing um, might be issued to the patient. So sometimes as few as um, while in the clinic during the earlier stages of treatment, it might be only a day or days at a time, but over time then extending um, those periods. Of course, uh, anyone who works in addictions is well familiar with the use of uh, urine drug screens for monitoring um, as a way to help to encourage treatment adherence, to um, corroborate the reported progress, and to allow for earlier identification and intervention in the event of a slip or relapse. And we asked patients upon their enrollment to agree to provide not only contact information and urine drug screens upon request, often in conjunction with the monthly buprenorphine clinics, but also if contacted to report um, for um, testing on a random basis as well. In order to implement the program, letters were sent to the identified current established buprenorphine patients at UMass, um, which described the clinic, explained the rationale for our movement toward that model of care, the requirements of participation, and if they chose, the option to receive assistance and a referral out. People were not compelled, um, but we decided that this was really the ideal model and that part of the difficulty that was coming in providing consistent treatment was the wide variability that we had in terms of expectations for continued participation. Um, these individuals were invited to attend an informal session with, ref um, with refreshments. We had pizza and, uh, and soft drinks. Um, the consent forms were provided at that time for people to review, some which were signed then, some others which took a little time to make that decision, understandably. Of the 15 eligible patients that we had at that time, and remember, this is not representative of our entire buprenorphine population, but these are individuals who um, had a clearly identified need for a different form of treatment that wasn't being met in the traditional um, clinic modality. So of the 15 patients who were identified as being eligible at that time, um, 13 of them, or nearly 90%, chose to participate, um, and an additional patient enrolled during the initial evaluation phase. At five months of the 14 patients who had been enrolled, um, 12 were, again, nearly 90% were present and completed the survey, the results of which we'll be reviewing shortly, um, providing demographic and clinical characteristics, as well as feedback regarding the buprenorphine clinic, including um, quantitative and qualitative um, feedback. Um, I present to you the information regarding de demographics and clinical characteristics for a couple reasons. Um, one is every clinic is going to have uh, differences in terms of their patient populations, and so I would invite you as you review these to um, perhaps consider what are the similarities or differences between um, 
our experience and those that you might um, meet in your setting. And that can help to inform what aspects of, of this model that you may wish to incorporate into your own um, and those areas in which you might need to take a different uh, stance or position. So um, mean age for our initial population was 43 years, but with a broad range, as you can see, from 20 to nearly 60, predominantly uh, Caucasian, um, male, um, half were married, um, with another 25% each being single and 25% divorced. The employment rate was nearly 60%. Um, again, reflecting the degree of stability that had been made available to these patients as a result of buprenorphine therapy. 42% um, were employed full-time and 17% part-time. So slightly less than half, fewer than half um, unemployed. Um, ours is a generally well-educated um, population. We are in a university town, the University of uh, Michigan in Ann Arbor, so you can see nearly 16 years of the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in our patient population, but again, a fairly broad range from eighth grade um, through the equivalent of PhD levels in education. In terms of clinical characteristics, um, patients were asked the length of their opioid problems, and uh, these centered on nearly 14 years, but with a range of less than one to one individual who claimed opioid problems reaching back over three decades. And an interesting finding was that many of the patients, um, nearly 60 percent, stated that their introduction to problematic opioid use was a result of pain management, with approximately 40 percent saying that they um, had a primary substance use disorder essentially from the outset, or that's what directed them um, to opioid misuse. Three quarters, or 75 percent, had a history of other substance dependencies, including alcohol that excludes nicotine, um, which we'll get to in just a moment. Importantly, episodes of addictions treatment, um, illustrating the, the chronicity of this, of this disorder. Um, the patients averaged five previous episodes of addictions treatment and a range of from one to 15. Um, more than 80 percent had a concurrent psychiatric diagnosis on their medical record. 75 percent um, were receiving psychiatric medications. Um, half were cigarette smokers. Um, 92 percent identified a goal of abstinence from opioids and other substances, excluding buprenorphine and nicotine. Um, uh, and the same number, the same percentage um, had reported 12-step, um, such as AA or NA meeting attendance. Um, last use of opioids, with the exception of prescribed buprenorphine, um, was approximately two years. Um, and the daily dose of buprenorphine in terms of milligrams per day um, was, the mean was about 14 milligrams with a range of 4 to 40 milligrams per day. Looking at results regarding um, attendance and urine drug screens, these were the process measures that we spoke of um, at the beginning of the presentation. In terms of attendance, um, Gratifyingly high. In, to in total, patients attended 52 of 58, or 90 percent of all the regularly scheduled clinic sessions um, once they were enrolled and started, with more than half of these individuals, nearly 60 percent, attending all the available sessions. Um, in terms of urine drug screens, um, of those of, that were obtained at the clinic, um, over 90 percent were negative for um, recent alcohol and or other drug use. And part of our panel is uh, for ethoglucuronide, which um, shows alcohol use during the past 72 to 80 hours as well. So there was really only, one, aside from alcohol, only one other positive screen, which was not an opioid. In terms of patient satisfaction, as I mentioned, we obtained both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, patients were asked to respond on a five-point Likert scale to um, several statements regarding their experience that were um, specifically designed to reflect what we had er identified earlier as being some of the principles of the essential features associated with the buprenorphine clinic. 
uh, when asked um, whether or not they'd received clear information and instructions about how to take buprenorphine, 92% um, agreed or strongly disagreed or strongly agreed rather with that statement. Um, staff members at buprenorphine clinic are concerned with my safety and comfort. 83% um, agreement rate with that statement. I know how to obtain prescription refills through the buprenorphine clinic, again over 90%. I found the psychosocial treatment sessions, the therapy and education to be helpful to me, 75%. The frequency of buprenorphine clinics, that is once a month, makes sense to me. Again, 75% response rate. Um, perhaps one that I think reflects most positively on this model, a multidisciplinary model, and one that was really gratifying to um, hear from the patient, the statement, the members of the buprenorphine clinic, meeting medicine, nursing, and social work, work well together. And to receive a 100% um, agreement rate with that um, was highly affirming and validating. And finally, participation in the buprenorphine clinic has been helpful to my treatment and recovery, 83%. Um, so when one, uh, you may reflect on your own clinical experience in treating um, what is oftentimes a difficult patient population and to receive patient satisfaction survey results um, of this nature was, uh, was uh, really gratifying. We also obtained qualitative measures. Patients were asked to provide um, written feedback to two open-ended questions. One, what was most helpful during your participation in the buprenorphine clinic, and what suggestions would you make to improve the clinic? Um, all respondents um, provided some positive written feedback regarding their experiences, and most offered comments in more than one area. Some themes emerged in reviewing those written responses. Um, three areas in particular emerged, including the idea of group identification and membership, precisely one of those things that patients had um, lamented before the creation of buprenorphine clinic, a feeling as if they belonged, that they had a dedicated group to which they were a valued member and were not being cast as second-class citizens even in an addiction treatment milieu. Some of the subjective statements were getting to know a group of people who have a similar background um, that is uh, sober and in recovery, but taking Suboxone has been in, invaluable. Um, another quote, listening to other people's stories, their experience with the medication. Another comment, um, the group sessions have always been a plus in getting myself to express my feelings and adjust with my shyness. The second theme that emerged was that of medication, some brief mention by 40% uh, or, or greater regarding just the utility of, the, of buprenorphine itself. And uh, finally, the multidisciplinary team and uh, a, a third of the participants identifying that as being um, one of the most helpful elements. Um, as an aside, virtually each and every one of the members of the multidisciplinary team were mentioned by name during the survey process. In terms of suggestions, um, 8 of 12 or, or uh, 2 thirds provided suggestions for improvement. Um, no themes in the same way as the positive comments um, were identified. Um, not, they didn't emerge in the same way. Most of these tended to be individual concerns and uh, with an N of 1 for each of the comments. So some of those included physical distance to the clinic, schedule conflicts, structure, content, or frequency of session, and the cost of urine drug screens. Quotes that were associated with that feedback where I hope that as we progress, we would need to be here less often um, and that more structure and content in monthly meetings would be appreciated by some. Interestingly, um, four of the 12 respondents or a third stated none in response to ways that they would change that or even countered with other positive responses. For example, uh, one respondent wrote, keep up the program, it has saved my life. One patient uh, made a, a statement that we, we thought was quite representative of the replies or responses that we'd heard collectively, and it was an, a, 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 a nice way to capture and reflect um, some of those thoughts and ideas. Um, the quote is that a combination of medication, individual therapy, and group is important. The support of the nurse, in this case the nurse especially, and all other staffers is excellent. 
the therapy of using Suboxone as a basis for treating my disease makes sense to me. Having abused opioids over a period of 35 years off and on, I know that I'm not normal without the chemical readjustment that buprenorphine provides. With it, I am relaxed, creative, energetic, and free of cravings and the fear of withdrawal. To summarize then, respondents showed high levels of patient satisfaction, attendance, and adherence in a monthly buprenorphine clinic for opioid maintenance therapy in an outpatient addictions treatment program. Um, among the strengths of this um, initiative were um, having identified and addressed deficiencies in a continuum of care. Principles of continuous quality improvement were employed, um, including the essential features of patient participation, psychosocial treatment administered in conjunction with pharmacotherapy, and a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, the results of our findings were fed back to patients, and they reviewed and uh, approved those findings prior to the release of results, first in the presentation of a poster at a um, uh, professional conference, and later the manuscript for the publication to which I referred you earlier. The success has led to the addition of a second um, monthly clinic here. Limitations of uh, this project are uh, an admittedly small sample size. There is some considerable selection and self-selection bias for this process, which actually from a clinical perspective may be um, desirable for treatment matching. It's a relatively short evaluation period. Um, this is a highly specialized treatment setting here at the University of Michigan with the capacity to diagnose and treat concurrent psychiatric disorders, and we know that may not be the case in every um, uh, treatment setting. It was a relatively homogenous patient population, predominantly male, Caucasian, relatively well-educated, employed um, with some mutual health group involvement. Um, in contrast, though, there was some considerable range as noted in relation to the years of opioid problems and daily doses of buprenorphine. Um, patient satisfaction, the patient satisfaction survey um, was generated for quality improvement purposes and so has not been subject to the rigors of psychometric testing. Um, and these factors together may limit the ability to generalize findings. Um, nonetheless, certain principles and procedures inherent in the design and implementation of our own buprenorphine clinic may have some merit and uh, applicability across various treatment settings. Um, and in closing, in light of the mounting evidence that drug dependence is a chronic medical illness and that, quote, long-term strategies of medication management and continued monitoring produce lasting benefits, as stated by McClellan et al. in their seminal paper in 2000, even modest advances in the treatment of opioid dependence hold important promise for the future. Um, with that, I'll hand it back to um, Dr. Fennell for any um, questions, answers, and discussions. Thank you, Dr. Strobe, for an excellent and informative presentation um, that was uh, very clear and, and uh, enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, there is a question that came in about um, how induction was done. I wondered if you could speak to that. There are two primary modalities for induction. One is in the context of ongoing uh, withdrawal from opioids, and for others um, who may have gone beyond the immediate withdrawal process, um, induction is possible um, with, with, with in a slightly different approach. So. Instructions are pretty clear, and as I said, the parameters are pretty clear. If an individual comes in and they are in active withdrawal, then um, uh, generally start with a relatively low dose of buprenorphine, um, two milligrams or so, and monitor response. And it's treated as, it, as almost any other acute detoxification episode. Um, as I mentioned, because of the high binding capacity and the fact that buprenorphine is a partial mu agonist, um, patients actually they need to come in while they're in active withdrawal. If they have traces of opioids still on board and you administer the med medication, you will um, in it unwittingly um, induce 
um, opioid withdrawal, which is really unpleasant. So oftentimes clinicians will say, we need you to come in sick, and you'll be able to leave feeling much better. Um, we published on certain principles regarding outpatient um, detoxification, and so there are other safety um, parameters and considerations along those lines that you would want to follow as well. For individuals who have had difficulty maintaining um, abstinence um, over time, induction, you need to make sure that there has been no opioid medication administered during the past seven to ten days is the usual parameter. So that would require a negative urine drug screen and some uh, confirmation that there had been no other drug exposure prior to the administration of a non-detoxification related induction. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions that relate to um, tapering and um, how you approach those issues, deciding if and when to begin tapering. And um, when patients are tapered, do you have many who relapse? Excellent considerations, and I think that th this is still an area which warrants additional investigation um, and writing as well. Um, I, I think that there are some who would suggest, um, certainly um, hoped that with buprenorphine maintenance therapy that it might be used as a support or a stabilizing agent while other supports and reinforcements regarding treatment and recovery um, were developed, including mutual health group meeting attendance, and that perhaps somewhere in the neighborhood of between one and two years an individual might have made sufficient uh, progress. I, I think that what many clinicians have found is that it can be very difficult to be very challenging to move toward discontinuation of medication and one really needs to weigh the risks and benefits associated with that. There may be some individuals that they've had a long-standing history of opioid dependence um, that for whom a harm reduction model might in fact be um, their best possibility for sustained treatment and recovery. For others with a less pronounced history, um, certainly we what we had asked is that patients, whatever it is that they were deciding, whatever goals it is that they had for themselves regarding their treatment, simply that they would include us as partners so that we would be able to work with them. We have discontinued buprenorphine successfully for some patients. For example, one of our subspecialty populations is the treatment of health professionals. And uh, for nurses or physicians, pharmacists um, who may not want or be able to practice, with ongoing opioid maintenance therapy, we have um, successfully um, tapered and moved toward an abstinence-based model. But certainly, it is not a risk-free consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and you may have answered this, but how long do uh, they stay? Patients stay on buprenorphine. Some and, patients and may stay on this medication indefinitely, as was the case with, uh, with methadone. So we now have some individuals who've been at our, um, at our clinic for some few years now continuously with no um, lapses to other illicit drug use. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and um, how is pain, whether it be chronic or acute, managed during the Suboxone induction and also the maintenance? That's a great question and uh, one that could uh, that uh, um, warrants an, an, an entire presentation itself. In fact, Dr. Um, um, Peggy Compton uh, did um, one of these seminars as well talking about some of the interface between pain and opioid dependence. Um, happily for our subpopulation, what we found is that for, for a subset of individuals, the use of buprenorphine actually can be effective in addressing some of the pain considerations as well. So I mentioned 60 percent of the individuals in our um, program um, identified their primary exposure and problematic opioid use to having been um, encounters with, with pain management. It's a highly complex and specialized consideration, um, and I would refer the reader 
to or the listener rather to a publication that will be issued soon um, by the American Society of Pain Management Nurses, um, ASPMN, and INSA, the International Nurses Society on Addictions, on how best to uh, um, to address and treat um, this dual challenge. Mm -hmm. Good, great. Um, how likely is it that a person would decide to get um, off the program? Um, so uh, I'm presuming here it means um, discontinuing the Suboxone um, you know, on, their, um, on their choice. And how difficult is it? It can be problematic for individuals. Um, some will report, some patients will um, come down to um, absolute minimal, relatively minimal do doses, and it seems as if those last few milligrams per day can be a challenge. Um, so motivation, um, external considerations, or encouragement um, are are factors. Any other complicate, uh, I mean, other clinically complicating factors would uh, be relevant as well. So uh, again, taken in the context of uh, you know, an individual patient who has struggled for years, who has lost a great deal um, personally as a result of their opioid dependence, um, they may be very guarded, hesitant to um, discontinue um, opioid maintenance therapy, and in some instances that may, in fact, um, be the recommended approach to take. We'll support patients in whatever um, their individual goal is in terms of continuing or discontinuing opioid maintenance therapy. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I'm going to just uh, pitch one more question now before we end. Um, could you talk a little bit about the long-term members uh, or people that are on buprenorphine, and do they attend groups? Um, every month at the clinic, um, and kind of a parallel question with that is, uh, do you do any booster sessions in terms of um, people that um, may be on longer-term um, treatment and want to maintain contact with the group? I'd, be, I'd love to comment on those two things. One of the things that we found that was really encouraging was the fact that there was um, a true group identification. When we reached a point where numbers were such that we recognized we needed to create a second buprenorphine clinic, we, and we went to the group itself and asked their input about how it is that they would like us to go about doing that. And group members identified so strongly with the bonds that they'd made in the context of that first buprenorphine group that they wanted to stay together as a group. There was also a high, but there's, there has still been room for new members as well. And that enculturation has been really positive to have an established group. And then as new members come in, they can help newer members with issues about how do I, um, how do I attend mutual help groups? How do I balance um, the considerations between abstinence-based programs and my need for maintenance um, therapies? Um, mm -hmm. And absolutely, um, Dr. Fennell, in terms of booster sessions, as I said, Buprenorphine Clinic was designed from the outset to complement whatever other um, clinical care was needed in the context of addictions treatment and recovery. So in some instances, people may have an onset of some psychiatric distress, for example, or may need um, heightened levels of individual, family, or group therapy, and those are um, provided in addition to rather than instead of other treatment modalities. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our time is now up. I uh, want to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. Uh, shortly, webinar participants will receive an email from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry that includes a link to an evaluation survey. And we would ask you to take a few minutes to access it and provide your feedback on today's session. Today's webinar was recorded, and it will be posted in the events section of the INSA website, which is www.intnsa.org, and also the website of the Prescriber's Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies. That site is www.pcss-o.org. Um, we hope that you will join us for upcoming sessions, and we we'll look forward to your participation in future webinars. Thank you.